Good morning. Today we will be studying in Exodus chapter 3. Last week, Will introduced us to a couple of concepts, echoes, and how do they, we can see themes throughout the Bible that we have heard and read. These will call out to us. We'll be diving deeper and taking a look at these echoes this morning, but first, let's take a look at where we left off with Moses and his response to the burning bush and God's commission. To pick Moses back up after the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. <coughs> then the Lord said, I, will surely see, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of the taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. A land that is flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I, will also, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Everything God is saying, Moses is like, yes, you should do that. You see what's going on. You see how Egypt is treating Israel. You are going to get them out of Egypt and into a nice place, land of milk and honey. I cannot agree more. Let's see, verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Send who? Me? You want me to go to Pharaoh? All of a sudden, Moses changes his tune. He's like, wait, what? I thought you were going to do this, God, not me. Let's see, verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. God's response to him highlights the fact that Moses was not asking the right question. God is not telling him why he chose Moses, but that God will be with him. Moses is asking God, why is he qualified to be the one sent to Pharaoh? A good thing to keep in mind and ask ourselves Whenever we are doing anything, is God with me? If the answer is not a yes, we should not do that thing. <laughs> if we need to, we can ask God for more clarification, and no response is not a yes. God has even helped us out by having his will written down, even sending us the perfect example to follow, Jesus. Ellen White explains that Moses' earlier actions to kill the Egyptian was not God's path to free Israel from Egypt. Quote, In slaying the Egyptian, Moses had fallen into the same error so often committed by his fathers, of taking into their own hands the work that God had promised to do. It was not God's will to deliver his people by warfare, as Moses thought, but by his own mighty power, that the glory might be ascribed to him alone. Yet even this rash act was overruled by God to accomplish his, God's purposes. Moses was not prepared for his great work. He had not yet learned the same lesson of faith that Abraham and Jacob had been taught, not to rely upon human strength and wisdom, but upon the power of God for the fulfillment of his promises. And there were other lessons that amid the solitude of the mountain, Moses was to receive. In the school of self-denial and hardship, he was to learn patience, to temper his passions. Before he could govern wisely, he must be trained to obey. His own heart must be fully in harmony with God before he could teach the knowledge of his will to Israel. By his own experience, he must be prepared to exercise a fatherly care over all who needed his help. I know I can relate to this thinking. I know what's best, I can accomplish the task with my own strength, but am I working with God, or just doing my own plan? God's plan is not always what we want or expect the plan to be. 
This reminds me of Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. Jesus did not want to be taken prisoner, beaten, shamed, humiliated, and ultimately crucified. I would not say that was his ideal plan. However, what was Jesus' mindset? It is not my will, but your will, God, that will be done. Moses had 40 years after killing the Egyptian to gain wisdom, patience, temper his passions, learn to obey, and have the harmony in his heart with God. Yet, we will see Moses still struggled with his plan versus God's plan. Chapter 3 continues on with Moses. He's concerned that when he goes back to the children of Israel, no one will believe him. He's like, I talked to God. This is what his message is. They'll be like, nah. <laughs> so God gives his name as proof. Tell them, I am Yahweh. God then reassures Moses, they, Israel, will listen to your voice. So it's all settled then. God will be with Moses. He has the name Yahweh as proof. Moses says everything he needs. We'll continue on in chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Moses still thinks the name Yahweh is not enough. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. I think it's interesting to note here that when God said he would send him to Pharaoh, he's like, nah. But when God's like, see that snake? Go pick it up. He's like, I will pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue in verse 5. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside the cloak, his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous, like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they would not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Moses now has seen two miracle transformations and has four signs to prove that he met Yahweh. The last sign he had to take on faith that it would work. However, after seeing the other two done, I don't think Moses would be like, that last one might not work. He has staff to snake, hand to leper, water to blood, and Yahweh's name. There's no way no one would believe him, right? All of Moses' concerns have been alleviated. Let's continue in verse 10. Moses went back, sorry, verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Moses is still trying to ask the why me question. Why would you choose me if I'm not eloquent? And you want me to speak to the whole congregation of Israel? You want me to speak directly to Pharaoh? Moses thinks he's not adequate to be a leader due to his speech. Many times we may think we are not enough or that the situation is too tough, but let's see how God responds. Verse 11, then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? It is, not I, is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what to speak. God again is patient in explaining that nothing is impossible with him. He has made the mouth, he has made speech, and he will be with Moses teaching him what to speak. Verse 13. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. <clears throat> this reminds me of someone lining up excuses instead of just saying they do not want to do something. Someone would say, 
you know, I want to hang out this evening. You're like, I still have to rake leaves. It's like, oh, I can help you rake leaves. Then we can hang out afterwards. Well, I have to then back in the house after I rake leaves. I can help you there as well. Well, I just don't want to hang out tonight. <laughs> Moses was like, yeah, no. And God was like, yeah, away. <laughs> Verse 14. <laughs> Let's sink in a little bit. <laughs> Uh, verse 14, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall sp speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. Moses still was not convinced if he wants to do it. God already had a solution in place. Your brother will come out and help you. He is actually on his way. I can just see Moses, you know, <laughs> leans his staff up against the cliff. All right, I'll go see Aaron. And God's just like, don't forget your staff. <laughs> we will pick this back up in verse 27. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words of the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Contrary to what uh, Moses expected, he received a most favorable welcome. As this earlier conversation with God reveals, Moses never anticipated a scenario like this. Everything looked set for a successful mission, yet God had already given Moses a tip that Pharaoh would not be so easy to let them go. Most people might look at this passage and focus on Moses' lack of belief in himself and trust in God. He might be tempted to think that there's no way that I would do that if God asked of me. That I, a humble servant, ready for anything God asks of me, would do that. Look to your left. Look to your right. We are all still sinning. Yes, we have been born again and strive to sin less and less. None of us are perfect. We struggle with letting go of worldly desires, allowing God to take the reins, and following God's commandments. However, I would like us not to forget the reverse side. This passage is also about what God will do for his people. God heard his people crying out and put a plan in place. He called out prophets and leaders. Look at the care and patience he had with Moses' unbelief and fear. Look at the power he worked in the signs. All this was done so that the people believed. They bowed their heads and worshipped. We are not all perfect, just like Moses. Yet God still wants to and works in each and every one of us. It is not about qualifications. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Sometimes we think God moves quickly in a situation. But usually we think he's moving too slowly. <laughs> Often so slowly that we do not even see him moving. So we cry out, Abba, Father, where are you? In these times, we are tempted to forget that he is there. He is always near, waiting, reaching, working, strengthening. We just have to let him in. We know someone else who is working, and it just so happens they are perfect also. Our brother Jesus. Moses prophesied of Jesus' coming in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15.
the Lord your God, yeah, verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. And again, in verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Jesus was a prophet like Moses, and did you know that Jesus Christ's life is in Exodus? Similar to Moses in the Exodus of Egypt, his life echoes Moses and Aaron's lives and the events uh, in the Exodus of Egypt. Moses and Elijah proclaim this in Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 30. Verse 30, and behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke with his Jesus' departure, with which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Departure here is the Greek word exodus, spelled with an O-S at the end, though. There are two other occurrences that are found in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. Hebrews 11, 22 says, By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the Exodus. This is the same Greek word that is translated from Luke 9, 31. Of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Have you ever thought of the life of Jesus as an Exodus journey? What would you say if I said, what record in the Bible comes to mind if I said a ruler is killing young boys? You have Pharaoh killing all the Hebrew newborn sons, and like you said, Herod killing all the male children two years and under. You did not wake up thinking there was going to be a Bible quiz today, did you? <laughs> what record in the Bible comes to mind if I said feeding a multitude of people? You have Jesus feeds the 5,000 with loaves and fishes in Matthew. And you also have the Israelites in the wilderness ate manna and quail. There are actually parallels that go to even some of the oddest details where both records, only the men are recorded, the number. Also, Matthew chapter 14, verse 20, records that 12 baskets of leftovers were picked up. Where else does the number 12 remind us in Scripture? My first thought was 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles. What reckon the Bible comes to mind if I said 40 days and 40 nights? You have Moses, 40 days on the mountain. You have Noah, 40 days of flood. And you also have Jesus, 40 days in the desert, the temptation. I like this passage from the book of Echoes of Exodus. Quote, like Israel... Jesus has a lengthy period of wandering in the desert. The Spirit leads him into a dry and barren place in which he has to trust God for the provision of bread, resist evil, and stand on the testimony of Scripture. The specific temptations echo those that unraveled Israel, grumbling about the lack of food, testing God by demanding a miracle, bowing down to false gods, and seizing his inheritance before it was time. It is no coincidence that in all three of his temptations, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. In the sermon, Moses preached to remind Israel of their need for obedience. But Jesus succeeds where Israel failed. For all our familiarities with the Exodus story in Scripture, we have never seen this before. The all-too-familiar melody of failure has been transformed and turned into a song of hope. Today, we have these events recorded in the Bible, and without the intricate details, you might not know which passage someone is referring to. Remember this image that Will used last week in yelling at a canyon for an echo? Right, he's there. <laughs> um, that your voice repeats over and over. I want to take this example deeper and point out that an echo in a canyon might sound the same, same word repeats, 
but each echo is distinctly different. When an echo reflects off the surface, the pitch is often altered so that the echo is at a different pitch than the previous echo. For example, in a canyon, normally the pitch it gets lower. This principle can also be applied to the echoes in the Bible. Let's take a look at the last example, 40 days, 40 nights. Same exact words, which is actually pretty rare for the echoes. It's normally the theme or an idea that links. Yet, they have totally different stories. Pitch, yet Moses, Noah, Jesus. Yet, this links them in our memory, triggering, I've heard or read that before. Here are some other echoes between the Exodus of Egypt and the Exodus of Jesus. There are many more than what I have listed here. You have the Gentiles giving gifts. Israel was given silver, jewels of gold, raiment by the Egyptians when they left. Jesus was given gold, frankincense, and myrrh by the Magi. Wandered in the wilderness. You also have Elijah wandered in the wilderness, 1 Kings 19. Jesus, Matthew 4, and also Moses through Exodus. Followed after a prophet, a transfer of leadership between two of God's prophets. Joshua led God's people after Moses. Elijah led God's people after Elijah. And Jesus led God's people after John and even to today. Went up to the top of the mountain and had an angelic experience with God. You have Moses, Exodus 24. You also have Jesus in Matthew 17. Passover. Exodus. You have the plague of killing of the firstborn of the Egyptians and sparing the Israelites' firstborn. You also have in Matthew 26, Jesus crucified at Passover as the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. God's chosen people escaping, waiting, then returning. Israel escapes from Egypt and into the land, while Jesus does the opposite. He escapes from the land and into Egypt. The river Jordan, going through the waters of baptism. Aaron and the Israelites, they consecrated themselves by washing in the Jordan before entering the promised land. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the river Jordan. Taught what it means to obey the law and God. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and nights while receiving the Ten Commandments. Then he came down and taught the people. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and nights before he preached the Sermon on the Mount. Many Jewish readers of the first century would have recognized the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount as being identical to the beginning of the story of Moses receiving God's law. This would have struck a deep chord for those readers because every devout Jew knew Deuteronomy 18 proclaimed of a prophet like Moses to come as we saw. Every devout Jew expected this prophet like Moses, and the similarities between Jesus and Moses were clear. Jesus starts off his Sermon on the Mount with something radical, the Beatitudes. Jesus was signifying change, something new was coming. Later, he is building on Moses and the law, the Ten Commandments. You have the Sixth Commandment, you shall not murder. For the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. In the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. For the Sermon on the Mount, again you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. It might seem easy to see these connections to us because we have it written down. We can analyze it, we look at it over and over, find patterns. But what about the New Testament believers? <coughs> Did they notice the echoes? The Exodus of Egypt was taught to every Jew and they would have been deeply familiar with the account. 
They would have much of it memorized and definitely knew the main themes and the cadence of events. As other events happen, especially with Jesus, this would trigger natural connections and recall back to the exodus of Egypt. Events in e Jesus' life are like the exodus of Egypt because it is another exodus. What do the similarities between the exodus of Egypt and the exodus of Jesus mean for us today? The exodus of Egypt helps us to know where we are in the story of the exodus of Jesus. It also allows us to understand and see more depth to the life and sacrifice of Jesus and God's plan for mankind, his kingdom come, the promised land. We can find clues for what is to come looking at the exodus of Egypt. After Israel entered the promised land, they spent a lot of time, energy, and resources building the temple. This was the ultimate goal of the exodus of Egypt, to worship God. Even non-Israelites followed and worshipped God and were welcomed. Today, even though we have not reached the promised land, Jesus has come and started his exodus and is building his church, the temple, the final resting place for God. Let's see in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Greek word translated dwelt here can also be translated tabernacle. Jesus came and is the tabernacle, just like the Israelites built the tabernacle on Mount Sinai. Both were movable, not a permanent, finished state. The Israelites had to wait until they were in the promised land before building the temple, a final resting place for God to dwell. <coughs> Jesus' sacrifice allows us to experience pieces of God's kingdom now, the promised land. There are four other occurrences of the Greek word translated as dwelt here in the Bible. All of them occur in Revelation. You have Revelation chapter 7, verse 15, chapter 12, verse 12, chapter 13, verse 6, chapter 21, verse 3. <coughs> Revelation 21, verse 3 is not talking about the past, but the future. It is a future echo. Jesus is not done, and neither is our Father. The God of Exodus is still the same God today. He is caring, powerful, patient, listening, everywhere, loving, calling out. I could go on and on. Most importantly, he is working in every situation. In our age, unlike in Moses' time, we are also privileged to have our big brother, Jesus Christ, working as well. Is the Exodus complete? No. Not all are free. We are not in the promised land, the kingdom. We are living the Exodus. It is happening now. The Exodus of Jesus. Some might relate closer to certain events in the Exodus of Egypt, and we might be at different stages. Many of us here have passed through the waters of the sea, escaping our slave lives and born again. We're wandering in the wilderness. But guess what? We are not wandering aimlessly with no purpose like the Israelites waiting 40 years. God sent his son ahead of time. We are currently helping Jesus build his church, the new temple where we will be with God forever. Each and every day is an opportunity for us to serve and to build for our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you do for us each and every day, how you are our caring, loving Heavenly Father, and how we can just reach out to you in every situation that we find ourselves in, knowing that you are always there, closer than our very breath, wanting what's best for us, guiding us, strengthening us, giving us everything that we need. We know we are not perfect, we are weak, and we must rely on you, for you are our sufficiency. We thank you for you sending your son, for everything that he's accomplished, for everything that we can have in the lives that we have each and every day, for how we have the opportunity and the privilege to help build the church, the future, so that we can dwell with you one day. 
thank you for this. In the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.